Uh, so welcome to this webinar on ecological diplomacy. Uh, my name is Emma Hakala and I'm a senior uh, researcher here at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. And I'm very happy to be chairing this uh, event, which I've been looking forward to for a long time. Um, we will have really great speakers uh, talking about e ecological diplomacy, which is a kind of, a, I think, emerging topic in many ways. Uh, it's becoming increasingly clear how climate change and environmental change are affecting geopolitics as well. And especially, I guess, uh, in this point, um, as we are dealing with all kinds of crises and conflict uh, affecting us simultaneously, it's increasingly important to understand how these uh, resource and ecological aspects affect these dynamics. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have uh, great speakers to talk about these issues today, and we will have uh, a kind of a keynote speaker who is Olivia Hazard from the Carnegie Europe. Um, and she is um, a visiting scholar actually at Carnegie, and her uh, research focuses on the geopolitics of climate change uh, and the transistor, transition assured by by climate change and the risks of conflict and fragility associated to, to climate change and env environmental collapse. Uh, but Olivia also has a long background of uh, environmental peacemaking and she's a mediation fractioner for over 12 years. So she has a very sort of hands-on experience uh, in addition to this, um, I guess, more academic uh, experience. And she will be talking about this uh, initiative, I guess, of, of uh, Carnegie Europe on ecological diplomacy. And I'm looking very much forward to hearing more about that. And then the other speaker for today uh, is Anne Tarvainen from the Worldwide Fund Finland. Uh, and she has a long experience in international cooperation, uh, especially in development cooperation. Uh, and she has been at uh, WWF Finland for eight years, uh, managing the international portfolio. Uh, but she's also been working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Finland, the UNDP and various NGOs, uh, as well as the Finnish Environmental Institute. And she will be talking about, uh, I guess in particular, about this uh, new report that's up upcoming from uh, WWF which is also connected to the, the questions of security and ecological uh, aspects. So yeah. after these uh, presentations, we will have uh, time for hopefully very lively <laughs> discussion. Uh, but I ask you already now to write your questions, uh, maybe already during the presentations when you just think of them, you can write them down in the in the chat uh, and then I will read them out and then we will talk about them, but any comments and questions are very, very welcome. And I guess without further ado, we can go on with the first presentation from Olivia. So I will share her presentation. Oops. And the camera is over there, right? Great. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. I'm very happy to be in Helsinki and to be at FIA. Um, and um, my name is Olivia, Olivia Lazard. I'm a visiting scholar at Carnegie Europe, as Emma mentioned, focusing on ecological plundering, climate change, and climate transitions in the light of geopolitical change. And uh, I, before I start presenting, I'd like to give a bit of a larger background on why I'm here today. I'm here after having toured many different capitals in Europe um, and having talked with European institutions on the very important need for the European Union and its member states to adopt ecological diplomacy at the heart of its foreign policy. What is ecological diplomacy? It is an approach essentially that reconciles climate stabilization with ecological integrity and environmental regeneration, anchoring environmental regeneration approaches in human security and in geopolitical de-escalation. 
the very assumption at the base of ecological diplomacy is that ecological integrity and ecological health is the foundation for human security as well as international security. And when we published our report at Carnegie Europe in July 2021, we were already convinced that it was quite a matter of urgency to shift the focus away from climate security and complement what the European Union was doing in terms of climate diplomacy with ecological diplomacy. But in light of recent events on the European continent, we're even more convinced that the European Union has a role to play and an agency to embrace through ecological diplomacy to try and salvage its own peace project in the future in a climate disrupted world and ensure that transitions related to climate change are done in a way that foster resilience at home and inter-resilience with other regions of the world, particularly on the African continent, the Latin American region, and in the Indo-Pacific. So without further ado, I'd like to give you a sense of why we came to this notion of ecological diplomacy and why we believe that it goes one step further than the current um, you know, framework that the European Union has adopted on climate diplomacy and on climate security. We've looked at the challenges of human security in light of climate disruptions, which are accelerating in scope, accelerating in pace, and accelerating all over the world and therefore in multi-geographies. This is what the latest IPCC report, which was published two weeks ago, tells us, one week ago, tells us. Within the context of um, climate disruptions, there's been an agenda that's been developed since 2007 called the Climate Security Agenda. And at the time when it was first brought up at the UN Security Council, there was essentially this notion that, well, there was a question. There was a question that was posed. This question was, how will or how does climate change aggravate or create new conflict dynamics in the field? There was a narrow bias with this question, with the way that it was asked. It was logical that it was asked this way in 2007 because climate disruptions were not quite identified as being so severe as they are today. And because the UN Security Council was looking through the lens of its own mandate, so essentially looking through places that were already disrupted by conflict and threatened by conflict, and therefore having a geographical aspect but there was also another you know, bias, which was essentially that we understood climate change as something which resulted from the release of excess greenhouse gases coming from industrialized nations as a result of energy systems which were fossil intensive. And this still stands. We know that climate change results from the release of excess greenhouse gases in the atmosphere as a result of industrial and energy activities in industrialized economies but it missed out on a larger issue. It missed out on a reverse question, which was how does conflict, how does violence, how do criminal activities contribute to climate disruptions, climate destabilization, destabilization, sorry, and environmental plundering, and therefore put into focus the fact that terrestrial and marine ecosystems as well as the global climate regime function interdependently. The reason why this was important for us to reintegrate that question is because when I was in the field, and as Emma mentioned, I've been active in Africa, the Middle East, North Africa, parts of Latin America and in, and in the Indo-Pacific, every time that I would talk to conflict practitioners about climate disruptions, they would tell me that this is not something that we can change anything to. The drivers of climate change are located in the global north, quote unquote. We are not active. We cannot find our agency on the drivers of climate change because they are outside of the places where we work. Except that obviously this is untrue. And this is untrue because if you look at this map, 
you will find, and this is a map that was published in late 2020, I believe, in uh, the journal Nature, and you can find the references in our publication on ecological diplomacy at Carnegie Europe, you will see that the red and orange aspects, the, 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 the context on this map, are highlighted as the global regeneration priority areas. The red and orange areas on this map are essentially all the places where we urgently need to protect as well as regenerate terrestrial and marine ecosystems that contribute to regulating and stabilizing the global climate regime. And you will probably notice that all of these different red and orange spots are located for the most part in conflict and fragile zones. That means that there is an essential role to play for the peacemaking, security and development communities, not as marginal actors in the fight against climate change, but actually very much as front liners. They are the upfront firefighters in the fight against climate change, and they are one of the first responder communities when it comes to ushering nature-based solutions or as we have called them in this particular report, nature-based processes in a way that helps to reconcile human societies with natural systems. The key in this map is to understand that when we talk about nature-based solutions and the way in which we partner with nature in order to fight against climate change, in order to mitigate climate change, and in order to adapt to climate change, as the latest IPCC report tells us, we need to anchor strategies in local contexts driven by inclusive governance and processes that include women, youth, indigenous populations in a way that helps them to respond in their own context to the incoming climate disruptions that are that they're going to be facing more and more and that reverberate essentially local strategies at national and regional levels and that need to be met with heavy climate finance for mitigation and for adaptation. And the UNDP has recently, the Climate Security Mechanism has been doing a really interesting work on how to connect essentially you know, big uh, climate finance flows for climate mitigation and adaptation to conflict in fragile countries, which is obviously a really important uh, aspect of what we're facing in terms of challenges and that we need to sort of integrate in how we look at peacemaking going forward, how to integrate essentially a climate and an ecological lens in how we build peace, how we stabilize conflict, how we solve conflict and manage conflict over time, and how we make sure that we understand essentially the concept of security as first, let's try and understand what are the interlinkages between human activities and natural systems? How do we protect natural systems for the benefit of local communities, as well as for the benefit of climate action worldwide? And how do we therefore redesign peace processes, stabilization st strategies, um, development funding and development strategies in a way that looks at how to rebuild ecological integrity, rather than fragment it, and I believe that you'll be talking about this as well, how to make sure to maintain essentially the interlinkages between soils, water, biodiversity, and how we reinforce those ecological interdependencies to the benefit of human populations in their local environment, but also to the benefit of how to stabilize ecological interdependencies worldwide. And I want to insist to take a minute on that, we absolutely need to direct a lot of efforts around the tropical belts of the world, and particularly the Congo Basin, the Amazon Basin and the wet forests of Asia. Why? Because these forests, these ecosystems have an instrumental role to play in what we call atmospheric rivers. They do not just generate hydrological cycle and rain in their own ecosystem, they actually are instrumental to watering the rest of the world. The Congo Basin, for example, gives about 
of rainfall patterns to the Ethiopian highlands. The preservation of forests in the Congo Basin, which are currently being threatened by armed conflict, econ conflict economies around charcoal and timber, by development of infrastructures, by the, the, the DRC government, but also by geopolitical powers trying to create new spheres of influence across the world. We need to understand how to change the way in which we do development and security and human prosperity in a way that does not threaten the ability for these forests to function and to water the rest of the world. But we have a tension, we have a paradox, and we have an unresolved conflict as part of our global plan for climate mitigation. In order to transition, in order to decarbonize energy systems, and in order to transition towards digitalized economies, which is the next wave of industrial revolution, we need what we call critical materials. The Joint Research Center of the European Union tells us that at the very least, we have 32 critical materials that we need to rely upon and that we need to extract exponentially in the next decade in order to secure stable and effective transitions. These critical materials include rare earths, lithium, cobalt, borate, and other types of materials whose name I don't remember right now. As it so happens, currently, from a geoeconomic and geopolitical perspective, the country that is best endowed in those natural resources and that is best apt at processing the critical materials that everybody needs for their transition is China. The European Union is over 90% dependent on Chinese imports and processing of critical materials and of technologies coming out of these critical materials. We're particularly talking about solar panels, as well as digital technologies that we're all planning to integrate in the way we function from an economic perspective. Outside of China, the critical materials that we all need to transition are actually equally concentrated in conflict and fragile zones. In fact, they stand most often in the underground of the very ecosystems that we need to protect and that we need to regenerate going forward. So as part of the way in which we have done and planned climate transitions, we run the risk in the next two decades of pitting the climate against the environment, which techni technically makes absolutely no sense from a biophysical perspective, unless we plan on relying completely on geoengineered solutions in order to get out of the climate crisis. That means that essentially, if we go down this route, we would accept that nature has no role to play anymore in the future of human survival and human civilization on the face of the earth. What does it mean? It means essentially that we need to start looking at climate action and climate diplomacy as we need to move towards ecological diplomacy so as to ensure that we deal with nature as living systems. We're not just tackling a problem of excess release of greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere or only of carbon dioxide. We're looking at how to work in partnership with the carbon cycle, with the water, cycle, the hydrological cycle, how water moves from liquid to gas and back to liquid, and how we actually need to harness essentially um, uh, water vapor and water as a liquid to try and mitigate the effects of the carbon cycle. And we need to profoundly work on reinforcing our approach to ecological threats. Let them be from a pollution perspective, from an economic perspective, trying to switch away as much as possible from activities such as, you know, monocultures and agriculture or um, chemical, you know, intensive industries. So as to make sure that soils, water sources retain and regain some um, integrity. 
But we also need to look at the type of security threats that will be coming our way. Climate disruptions will accelerate in the next two decades. That means that there will be incoming shocks related to food systems, related to water accessibility and water availability that will trickle into human societies and that will cascade into economic shocks, political shocks, as well as potentially geopolitical protraction. We need to get better at understanding how these shocks travel, how they convey from one system to the other, and we need to preempt them and to prevent them going forward. And we still have a window of opportunity. This is what, once again, the IPCC report tells us. And in order to do so, we need to adopt essentially a vision which helps us to know exactly where we can mine for critical materials and where we cannot, because we may actually compromise the ability of ecosystems to function locally and globally, and how we can plan in a really strong and uh, forward-looking fashion energy mixes, obviously around the world, but in our case, particularly in the European Union and its partners. And this is of particular significance considering the latest events over the last two weeks with the Ukraine crisis. There is um, a key innovation that I'd like to talk about today, and um, I believe once again you will also sort of be addressing this uh, in your intervention, and that you've been looking at this at the WWF um, over the last uh, the last few years. We need to start talking about complex regeneration. At the moment, within climate action, everybody is talking about offsetting strategies and nature-based solutions, how to aforest, how to reforest certain parts of the world. This is all fine and good, it's essentially about planting trees, but we must understand that trees are not the silver bullet solution that we all want them to be. What is important is to recreate essentially an integrity from an ecosystemic perspective so that trees can survive in water challenged landscapes. That means that we first need to, re to rebuild water retention landscapes. That means that we need to harness the power of community work, that we need to support community processes, including in conflict and fragile zones, to work towards regeneration goals. So it's essentially changing the focus of dialogue, peace building, political mediation, from sharing resources to regenerating resources, starting with the very first lifeline objective to rebuild water tables in soils. And in order to do this, we need to massively switch in terms of how we do ecological design, how we re-engineer landscapes, not from only a technological perspective, but how we understand topographies, local biodiversities, local soils, local seeds, and how we reboot ecological services with the help and the support and the agency of local communities to the benefit of their water security, their food security, and so as to protect them from the incoming extremes that they're going to face as a result of climate disruptions. All of this is really important, and I want to drive this point forward extremely clearly, working at the local level with inclusive processes based on dialogue and on um, disaster relief, preemptive disaster relief, will help us to marry local solutions with global stakes. What is important is the role of peacemaking, development and secure actor, security actors in midwifing the processes that are necessary to reconcile human civilizations, human communities with their natural environment, and to protect the incoming threats, as I was saying, such as you know, how organized crime actors may actually prey even more on biodiversity from an animal and vegetable perspectives, because we're actually making these biodiversities scarcer over time. That's why in our report, we talk about scarcification rather than scarcity. We can reverse scarcity. We can work with nature in order to reboot ecological services. But we also need to take into account 
the fact that climate disruptions will be making this work harder and that we need to invest into this work now. The other thing that I want to uh, insist upon is that in order now to do so, and once again, I will insist on the fact that this is an insight that comes particularly as a result of the unfolding events of the last two weeks. The European Union has dealt with its own climate related transition from a technical and a financial perspective over the last two decades. It has been looking at energy mixes. It has been looking at how to uh, you know, deal with pledges, in incentivize pledges you know, from other actors around the world. It has not, however, looked at the energy transition and at climate related transitions from a geostrategic, geoeconomic and geopolitical perspective. The time to change that is now. We are currently facing in the European Union a weaponization of energy to decrease and weaken the ability of the European Union to function as a union. And we're currently facing a situation from a larger picture where actors that have planned their transition from a geopolitical perspective are essentially trying to run towards a new scramble for resources around the world, targeting middle powers and conflict in fragile affected countries for the benefit of their transition model at the expense of the international order, at the expense of peace and human security, and at the expense of European security, for that matter. Ukraine is, for example, one of the countries that the European Union had struck a partnership with in terms of critical material supply chains in July 21. It is no surprise that Russia is now starting to try and gain access to certain countries that are very well endowed in those critical materials, not as a way to become a technological hub, but as a way to become a power broker in the race to critical materials and in the race to transition modeling and geoeconomic re-engineering of international relations. So what does it mean for the European Union? It means that we need to look at the way in which we step into climate disrupted future. We are fighting greenhouse gas emissions and particularly carbon dioxide, but as a way to partner with nature, with living systems in their full complexity, and with human societies whose resilience we depend upon. European resilience in climate disrupted futures depends on the resilience of societies and regions in the rest of the world. And in the context of a geopolitical constellation, which is as protracted as it is today, the role of the European Union is to plan its transition in a way that serves climate justice, that invests into climate adaptation so as to ensure resilience, that works in terms of protecting societies from the incoming wave of potential conflict related to the scramble for resources, for critical materials in particular, but also for agricultural soils, for water resources, and for any type of resources that may enhance the resilience of countries in climate disrupted futures. That means that whereas we focused in the European Union a lot of our attention on fossil dependent countries, we obviously need to keep on working with these countries to ensure their own transition in a way that is smooth, that stabilizes societies and economies, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But we also urgently need to invest a lot of attention, resources, means, staff, HR capacity in how we partner with conflict and frag fragile affected zones in order to help with complex regeneration, in order to help with human security and with political mediation, and therefore test new approaches for how political mediation becomes a vessel for environmental peacemaking and for ecological regeneration. But from a more structural perspective, we also need to understand that the European Union 
we need to look at partnerships with Latin American, African, Indo-Pacific partners that is centered around their needs, starting with climate adaptation and climate mitigation, as well as human security stabilization. It also means on the longer term, looking at how we do geoeconomic modeling, that means investing into research for how we incubate regenerative practices at home and how we export them through a range of regulatory measures and schemes for public and private partnerships. That means understanding who is doing correct and adequate regeneration in the private sector, how we can support them and how we can also harness their power for sustainable and adaptive partnerships with um, societies abroad. It obviously means as well having a political agenda vis-a-vis -vis international and regional institutions to reform the economic system and shift it as much as possible from extractive to regenerative models. This is the challenge of our times. This is at the core of the fight against climate change. And this is an, a, a nut that we have not cracked yet. We do not know how to stabilize and um, sustain human civilizations without profoundly extracting from natural systems and therefore exhausting their abilities to sustain human civiliz civilizations. This is what we need to invest research in. And this, this is a multi-dimensional type of research involving industrial actors, research actors such as ourselves looking at international relations, research actors that are focused on environmental issues and ecological integrity. And beyond that, climate scientists, earth system scientists, as well as people who develop very localized solutions in Europe and elsewhere to enhance the resilience of their economies where they are and invest in rebuilding bioregional economies on the basis of different soils, different water resources and different type of like biodiversities. And if and when this becomes possible, the European Union will have to embrace an agency for geopolitical de-escalation. And this point is particularly prescient regarding the competition over critical materials and how to ensure that since we all need to decarbonize and since we all have a stake in making sure that we can move into a digital age, there need to be some resources, some legal frameworks in place, some regulation, some treaties and agreements that regulate the scramble for resources and ensure that needs can be met on the basis of energy mixes and not at the expense of the countries that are well endowed in those resources. I'll end there for now. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the questions. Thank you, Olivia. That was really interesting and very, um, very almost overwhelming. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about, but let's first give the floor for a bit shorter perspective on that. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm Anne Tarvainen from WF Finland. I'm the um, director of international cooperation, and I'm very happy to be here today. It's a little bit kind of uh, unorthodox or new area for WF to be part of the discussion, but we are very happy. And as you, ex Olivia, expressed that it's it's actually a very relevant topic for us as an environmental NGO to be part of the discussion about the global security. And we have noted it in our network and we are very happy to be part of the, the discussion today. As Olivia, you, you brought up in your presentation, the importance and the dependency of all of us on the natural resources and, and ecosystem services is the basis basics of of the of our well-being the human beings and and our economies uh, we normally we we like to use this so-called wedding cake model of the sdgs uh, showing how the sustainable development goals they are depending actually on the nature the biodiversity the oceans the water what you mentioned so they are the basis of the, all the other sustainable development goals. And the recognition of that is crucial when we are trying to solve any kind of societal societal challenges. And of course, they are impacting also the security issues globally. Um, 
and uh, actually, and, and it's, it's very timely to have this discussion today because next week in Geneva, there will be a starting of the international negotiations for the new biological, uh, global bio biological uh, framework. The CPD, the Convention of Biological Diversity, negotiations will start in Geneva, which has been postponed for several year, years because of the pandemic, which is kind of a little bit interesting because the, we can connect the, the root causes of pandemic to the economic, uh, the ecological uh, items and how we have been destro destroying the nature can be connected the, the origin of the zoonotic diseases. And now th that one of those diseases have prevented us to make a global agreement on, on biodiversity conservation. But now the negotiations are starting next week. So now it's the good time to discuss how and how to globally we are addressing these issues. And WWF Network is, is promoting nature positive by 2030. We, 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 are, we cannot anyway say that we have to stop biodiversity loss. We have to aim for nature positive. We have to stop the biodiversity loss. But as Olivia, you mentioned, at the same time, we have to start very um, strong uh, restoration approaches on those ecosystems which has been already destroyed or affected. So we, are, we have to aim for nature positive a world by 2030 to ensure that we its uh, nature is able to provide us the services what we need. And uh, thank you for sharing very interesting maps. I'm, I'm also bringing one map from Finland. The Finnish Environmental Institute Syke and Citra have published this uh, map, which is showing how Finland has, actually has outsourced some of our environmental impacts. So uh, this map is, is showing us uh, how Finnish food consumption, food consumption is uh, how much we need croplands to produce food, what we consume in Finland. And the, the colors are indicating uh, the, that kind of um, how strongly the co consumption is influencing the uh, species extinction. And then the circles are indicating the demand for the cropland, how many hectares. So, and, and it's one of the conclusions of this, uh, this research was that more than 90% of the bio, biodiversity impacts of Finnish food consumption are outside Finnish borders. So we definitely have also our impacts of our food consumption globally, and we can see of course, uh, big circles in Europe, but we can see big circles in the global south in the same areas where you identified also the biggest pressure. So in Finland, we have to look in the mirror and admit that actually the, how we are consuming in Finland, it has a global impact. And as you emphasize in your, your presentation is that the resilience at home is reflected globally. And we are depending on the resilience of those countries to be able also to produce because we are depending on those. We are we cannot close the doors, and 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 this has impact to these communities. They have to feed themselves, but in addition, they are feeding and providing services to us what we are using. And and this this risk and dependency is globally more and more recognized. World Economic Forum is annually publishing analyses of global risks. And, and this year, they, they again publish their risk categories. And we can see that among the top 10 global risks, uh, most of them are connected to environmental risks. Of course, the situation has now changed a little bit, especially in Europe. But but I believe and we believe that it doesn't exclude the importance and the role of the climate, but also biodiversity loss on, on extreme weathers, human environmental uh, <clears throat> damage and natural resources crisis, their role on, on the global economy. And if it's influencing economy, it's going to influence security. It's going to influence all the sectors. Um, 
WWF Network is going to publish a, a report, uh, its nature, security nexus. Uh, the topic of the, 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 the report can be also um, nature of peace and conflict. We were planning to publish the report last week, but unfortunately we had to postpone now the, the release of the report, but it will be coming up soon. Uh, on, on that report, we have this kind of picture of the nexus, how we see it. Uh, so we can see that environmental degradation and biodiversity loss has a negative impact of natural resources, livelihoods and human security. But it's at the same time, it, it causing when it's destroying, it's, it's putting more and more pressure to use the limited resources and it's causing insecurity and conflict. And when there is insecurity and conflict, it's um, also increasing the potential of illegal explo exploitation of the natural resources. And, uh, and uh, we are talking about illegal timber trade. We are talking about illegal wildlife trade. And, and these, these are seen and, and connected many times to organized organizations can be also terrorist activities. And, and actually the, the importance of the illegal, the, the role of illegal timber trade and illegal wildlife trade in globally on illegal, this kind of financial flows, it's, it's, it's quite extensive. It's more than 30% comes from this. And, and WWF Finland actually has been uh, working very hard and funding uh, our partner offices in East Africa to tackle illegal timber trade and illegal wildlife trade. And, and, and it's also important that we have recognized there that we cannot do it alone. We are partnering with UNODC, a lot of UN agencies, because as an environmental NGO, we cannot do it all. We need to organize ourselves and do cooperation with, with organizations who are tackling conflicts and peace and that kind of areas, because they are linked together in East Africa. So what should we do? And, and, and especially in Finland, I think that we just have to acknowledge our global impact, impact and dependency and act accordingly. The key message is what we want to see in the, in the global biodiversity framework, which is the negotiation coming next week, is the nature positive. So we have to stop the biodiversity loss and put the nature on kind of recovery mode. But, but we cannot do it only by doing conservation measures. We have to tackle the footprint. The, the map which I showed, we need to at least have the ecological footprint caused by our production and consumption habits. And, and in addition, we need to have a adequate resources I think that we have had these uh, um, targets on biological conservation for many decades, but they have failed. We haven't had enough resources. We have to have a strong implementation mechanism. And one important thing is what we call whole, whole of society approach. Uh, biological conservation or, or cannot be done by environmental ministries or environmental uh, NGOs. We need to have a whole of society approach. So which brings me to that kind of how happy I am, I am to be here today to talk with you because we have to have a dialogue and partnership with different organizations, different sectors, so that they are able to take climate change, but also biodiversity uh, loss as part of their agenda. So that brings me to that kind of nexus thinking, having a partnerships, whole of our, our society approach and I think it's not the rocket science, but we have to break the silos where we are going to like we are working on this sector, we are working on this sector, and, and this is government, and this is NGO, and this is research organization. And what is good about Finland that we are actually a very small country, we know each other. So why not we could be a world leading example that because we just sort it out together. In, in bigger countries, it might be a little bit more challenging, but in Finland, practically, we are quite small circle who are doing and talking about these issues. So let's 
let's talk and solve this and, and show others an example how it can be done, how we can be nature positive, how we can commit that Finland is halving the footprint so that we are not anymore causing that kind of impact in the south. And the time to act is now. The negotiations are starting next week, where Finland, as part of the EU, is making the commitment. And we should be pushing and ensuring that we have that kind of um, global framework, which we can later this year be agreed as a COP 15.2, in hopefully in Kunming, will be organized and all countries can sign and agree together. And here is just the kind of glimpse of the new report, what is coming from WWF Network. So, so the, the nature of conflict and peace, and, and there is a blog writing about, which has already kind of the major points of that, that publication. So it will be coming up soon, maybe in, in May. So, but in, in the meanwhile, we will be, especially in Finland, more than happy to discuss with the Finnish stakeholders and other possible cooperation partners about, about our views. So, thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was also really interesting and useful for the discussion, which we will then now move to. And indeed, I would encourage all the all the members of the audience to, to write your questions in the in the chat. And I will then read them aloud. Uh, at the moment, we don't seem to have any questions, but I'm sure that uh, our participants will have some, so don't be shy. But uh, this is good for me because I have any questions that I that I want to get to. So maybe I can start. Uh, I'll take the advantage of my situation here. Um, and actually, I can't quite decide what I should ask first <laughs> because there are so many things. But uh, I guess one thing that that you both sort of mentioned in in different ways, or that I sort of keep thinking about, and actually, especially you, on kind of where we're approaching on it, that um, in a way, even though it's it's clear that uh, we need to bring these climate and ecological um, aspects and elements into all kinds of policy making and especially security and, and development policy and everything. Uh, but that actually then requires um, sometimes quite even complex understanding of uh, this ecological sort of uh, interconnectedness and, and so on. So how would you solve the puzzle of uh, should we somehow train uh, people who are working on the security sector, for example, or how would you uh, bring this knowledge to, to the other sectors of the society? Um, maybe you can start. Yeah, I think that it's it's kind of bringing us in the same table to discuss. And, and we are not expert of the security issues or of, um, crisis management, but we have a lot of Finnish expertise. So we and other environmental NG, um, um, NGOs or entities can bring our views together and, and we provide our services for you. For example, I have an example from, from Myanmar, where the Finnish church aid has been working now on, on very fragile environment and providing humanitarian aid. But they recognize that actually when they are providing humanitarian aid in Myanmar, they would like to have a climate and environmental aspects on that. So they contacted WWF Myanmar and asked them to provide their expertise. They will be still doing the humanitarian operations, but they contacted expert organization, which happened to be WWF Myanmar, to provide the views how they can improve and make their operations more resilient. So that kind of practical reaching each other is, I think, the best way to start. And then, then of course, as you said, and as we know that it's very complex, we need to do some research. We have to have a research organization who can provide us that kind of analysis, what I showed, for example, what Suke and Citra has published, that we actually know where we are having an impact before we are able to mitigate those. Olivia, I know that you have experience, especially from the, the peace building side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's interesting that, you know, we were essentially showing today that, you know, it's possible to work in working silos and in integration. Um, 
I'd like to maybe start by pointing out that I'm the very first example of how a person who has focused on security for her entire life and mediation has switched towards understanding and having to understand mm -hmm. what ecological integrity is about. And I was not great at physics or bio <laughs> at school, but I managed to you know, self-educate myself over the last eight years in a way that makes perfect sense now. And it has completely changed my understanding of how we need to look at security. So once you start understanding that at the very basic of life in living systems, there are interdependencies that exist between soil, water, and biodiversity, you start understanding how we need to approach living systems and how to break silos. So it's not impossible to indeed sort of train people working in security and development and uh, mediation and even more largely everyone in society, because you're talking about whole of society approaches, I can't agree more with how do we how do we ask the right questions let's start there what kind of assumptions do we need to change around food systems for example um how can we change toward more towards more resilient food systems at home but also from an ecological perspective that means shifting from monocultures for example towards agroforestry agroecology a lot more sort of you know uh, seed and soil appropriate cultures in each and every place that we you know have in the world so it's it is about you know like having one from an educational perspective yes the right questions for framing the right type of action then bringing in different competencies together when we start talking about professional you know professional paths such as what we're doing today um i've also trained here in Finland, some people in the you know mediation hub, which has been set up not so long ago, and you know the water uh, diplomacy and uh, development network, and it is about sort of you know starting from where we function as professional sectors. We've looked at natural resources in very siloed ways. It's timber or fossils or mineral resources or biodiversity. Now we need to look at all of this from an ecosystem space perspective and understand how to re-gear essentially the way in which we do, again, mediation, mm -hmm. stabilization, development, et cetera, et cetera. There is an encouraging sign also, um, which we must be careful about. Every donor agency today in the world wants to work on climate mitigation or climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. This is great. That means that there are new funding streams that are becoming available that were not there even just two or three years ago. And believe me, I've been around the block <laughs> for a long time. We must be careful though. We must understand what is good climate adaptation, what is good climate mitigation, and what is not. And we need to anchor a lot of the investments into these regenerative approaches. It's not just about ecological regeneration, it's using ecological regeneration to regenerate social fabrics, economic fabrics, and oh. political fabrics over time. And that goes through governance, and therefore fighting corruption and predation and stuff like this. But the fact that donors want to work on this and are making funding streams available is good news. What needs to be put in place is the methodologies. How do you bring together different professional practitioners so as to look at the problems from an integrated perspective? And how do you actually bring in new competencies in? I've been arguing for over six years, you know, that we need to integrate people who work on ecological design, hydrological design within the way in which we do political mediation. We're not quite there yet. And so the question becomes, what is preventing us from moving there? There are some obstacles. They're not insurmountable. And we need to, you know, like organizations such as Carnegie, such as WWF, can play roles as incubators for professional mingling and intertwining and integration, and therefore development of new methodologies and approaches that then serve the purpose of donor funding. Yeah, thank you for that for both of you. It was kind of encouraging, even though, as you said, there are still things that we need to work on a lot more, but but maybe at least somehow hopeful that these uh, silos can be crossed. Uh, then we have a question from the audience from our friend uh, Antti Rautavara, <laughs> who <laughs> mentions the, the uh, water diplomacy preventive peace mediation um, uh, project that exists in Finland and that you also mentioned. 
Uh, and Anto was wondering how, because uh, the, the idea of the water diplomacy initiative is to, to be or work as a sort of umbrella and not be siloed into different sectors and different ministries and so on. But do you have any thoughts how we could improve and widen this approach on water diplomacy rather than engaging or somehow discarding maybe the water diplomacy and then just in engaging with the ecological diplomacy or do you think that's possible? Absolutely. Actually, I would t tend to think that water diplomacy is the starting point for yeah. ecological diplomacy. Yeah. Um, because water cooperation, as I was mentioning, you know, one of the challenges that we have, and I'll just repeat that quickly. Um, so it, it, the science tells us very clearly carbon dioxide is accumulating in the atmosphere at dangerous levels. Mm -hmm. It is warming the global climate and it is having tremendous repercussions around the world. What is less said and less understood is that by plundering ecosystems, by weakening them, we're releasing and releasing and releasing water vapor into the atmosphere. Water vapor is a more transient greenhouse gas. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide. CO2 stays for three to 400 years. Water vapor stays for a matter of a few days because it functions at an accelerated pace between terrestrial and marine ecosystems and within the atmosphere. But the fact that we're releasing water vapor at accelerated rates that we're not keeping water into the ground where it should be, where it needs to be made available for human resilience, human survival, human stabilization, human civilizations. We are actually accelerating the effects of carbon dioxide. And when we start talking in our current day and age, most of the climate disruptions that we talk about are fires, drought, and inundations or flooding. All three of them are water related. It's either too much water, or too little. So what we need, and this is where the idea of complex regeneration comes in, we need to work with regeneration so as to rebuild water retention landscapes, as I was saying. It's about re-attracting water, re-transforming re -transforming water from gas into liquid, stored liquid into the ground. That requires enhancing the ability of soils to be sponges, and in order for this to happen, we need all the biodiversity that we can get. We need to protect it from all of the threats that you were talking about. Agriculture, organized crime, territorial fragmentation as a result of development of infrastructures for energy and for other things. That means reshifting the way in which we do territorial planning, energy planning, food production planning, and we need to look at it from an ecological perspective and an administrative perspective. So to the question, how can we expand on water diplomacy today? First, water includes everything. It's not just transboundary waters or how to rebuild you know, river systems that are already in place or watersheds that are already in place. Take this as a starting point for sure, but don't just organize um, conflict stakeholders or watershed stakeholders, depending on contexts around how to divide access to resources, resources that are going to deplete over time if we do not mitigate and adapt to conflict. Rather than looking at how to divide and share, follow the pie metaphor in med mediation. The pie metaphor is in mediation, you don't just divide the pie, you grow the pie so that everybody can have a share of it, an increasing share of it. So regeneration offers an avenue where you say, we're looking at watershed moment, watershed areas, how to regenerate them and expand from watershed in how do we build regenerative economies that are going to be truly regenerative and therefore truly sustainable. And I'll give the example of um, Panama. Panama has had a really smart approach to maintaining its geostrategic positioning and economy in the world. It depends on the canal for how to function as an economy. The canal itself depends on watersheds that are feeding into the canal. The canal was having a lot of trouble for how to you know, maintain yeah. itself because of ship the shipping industry, because of you know, exploitation alongside the canal. So rather than just say, well, you know, we're going to uh, use technological solutions for how to fix the dampening of the canal and therefore which threatens our global economy, sorry, societal economy, we're going to regenerate the watersheds. And so the watershed actually helps to maintain 
the canal and the shipping industry, and therefore the economic stabilization of Panama. And it is now one of the global climate leaders in the fight against climate change. So all of this is about adopting the systemic approach. It's whole of society. How do you change like you know, sectors of the economy that deplete water systems? And how do you organize cooperation between transboundary partners or societal partners on the basis of regenerative practices rather than division and access to natural resources? And, and thank you, Antti, for, for excellent question, because it was actually on my notes to mention and acknowledge the water diplomacy network and the work what you have done. And I was kind of like noting that we should have a nature diplomacy or natural resources diplomacy. And I think that the water is, is the good starting point. And it's how you have developed that approach is a is, is good example, how you have brought the Finnish stakeholders together. As I said, that in Finland we are quite we are not so many. It 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 is easy to do in Finland, and 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 I think that the Panama ex example is 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 excellent on that sense. And it's the connectivity because we cannot we can talk about water, but when we are really talking about water resources, it's connected to the forest cover and it's all the other sectors, the biodiversity and so on. So because the water doesn't come from the tap, it's you have to have a water resources management in in large scale. So, um, it, it's welcome. <laughs> let, let, let's have let's have a discussion how to how to broaden it up from from water to the nature diplomacy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I have been taking notes because I'm also a part of the the water diplomacy project. Full disclosure. So, um, yeah, I think these are very important points to take into account. Uh, we just got a new question in the chat. Um, uh, Sami Pirkkala is asking, thanking first for the interesting presentations, but asking how do you see the role of the private sector in the, in the issues that we're talking about today? Yeah, I, th I think that yes, private sector ha has a role. Private sector has impact, so they have a role also to, to be part of the, the solution. And, and, uh, and when we're talking about the food print, many times the food print comes from the products, what we buy and, and the supply chains are many times global when we are talking about food um, items, for example. So and I'm, I'm, I can say that I'm happy to see that we have many Finnish companies who are very keen to, to discuss with WWF, for example, to, to, we have been talking about the climate, how they can be 1.5 degree resilient using the science based targets and, and we are looking for now the solutions how they can tackle deforestation in the supply chains mm -hmm. and and uh, we have the, also this kind of Finnish um, uh, water risk uh, tool as well and many Finnish companies have already taken into account and, and, and are applying that so yes uh, private sector has interest we have to be able to provide them um, variable uh, and, and verified ways how they can really contribute and measure the impact. But I think that it's important that we have also legislation in EU level, for example. Now the EU is preparing this kind of the deforestation law. So because we have to be able to end and, and put limits on those kind of uh, private sector entities or other entities who are doing harm for the nature. And unfortunately, legal kind of regulation is some sometimes needed, but we have to also acknowledge those companies who are already doing voluntary because they actually see it beneficial for their businesses to be forerunners and take these measures already in advance before there is a regulation. It's a really interesting question and uh, it's the, even though the question is about private sector agency, it actually relates to how do we change the system in which private sector actors mm -hmm. are active. Um, I'll start by saying that um, one, there is currently a danger inscribed in the Paris Agreement um, and in the way in which we have negotiated uh, the Article 6, the, the closure of the Article 6 at COP26, which is about offsetting strategies and, um, you know, carbon credits. Because we are framing climate-related transitions as a race to net zero and not full zero, mm -hmm. we're essentially going to see a lot of private actors trying to look at um, strategies for how to offset yeah. 
their business as usual model. Yeah. And we're seeing that everywhere, right? Yes. Like uh, air companies or textile companies mm -hmm. and stuff like this. There are some that are doing it well. There are some that are doing it very unwell. <laughs> Um, so once again, we need to sort of, you know, differentiate between what is good adaptation in climate disrupted presence mm -hmm. and futures and what is not. And what is good adaptation? You see some companies, I'm thinking, for example, of Patagonia, which was a front runner in how to transform its business model. And this is mm -hmm. how to transform the business model to become a regenerative actor. Okay. This means looking at how to do co-scaling and co-resilience with the communities mm. with which you work across mm. the world. How you adapt, in the case of, uh, of Patagonia, mm. we're looking at a textile you know, um, company. So we're looking at a company that relies on certain crops as well, um, such as cotton and others. How do you make sure that your cotton is grown in places that make sense, right? Not mm. in the Sahel, for example, which is currently being considered, even though yeah. the cotton is super water intensive. Not at all you know, appropriate mm. for the Sahel. How do you empower your uh, value chain throughout your value, mm. value chain you know, with community rights, um, social standards, mm. livelihoods, um, you know, remuneration at uh, just standards and things like mm. this? And how do you essentially sort of look mm. at your, uh, at the impact of your footprint throughout mm. your supply chain in a way that helps to Rechannel some of your profit, profits into mm -hmm. ecological regeneration. And Patagonia yeah. has done it for a long time. There are some issues with the way in which they gain access mm -hmm. to certain lands, which mm -hmm. at times can lead to expropriation, but they know it, they ask the questions, and they tackle the issue. They're mm -hmm. not hypocritical about it. Mm -hmm. They're also sort of looking at what are the wicked problems coming from the solutions that we propose, mm -hmm. right? So it's really constantly questioning themselves. Mm -hmm. We need to create more and more hubs for knowledge knowledge exchange, asking questions for private sector actors with public sector actors. And it goes to your point about, yes, we need private sector finance and agency, but we need to have, and they keep on saying it, we need to have the public frameworks that incentivizes us, that guides us, and you know that help us to really know what is good adaptation, what is good regeneration and stuff like this. That's where the uh, ESG standards and this taxonomy come in. Yes. And we're working on this at the European level. Um, here again, we need to, you know, putting political <laughs> negotiations aside, um, we need to help the European Union to shift from sustainability to regeneration and therefore yeah. to really sort of question what are the templates, what are the guidelines mm. for what regenerative behavior is about, how does it trickle up and down value chains and mm. extraction chains. And how do we monitor ESG application and punish or sanction when ESG standards so, are not respected? This is one of the key flaws. It's one thing to have a, a framework. You need to have some people to implement the framework. That means that you also need to implement some new types of education in business schools and in uh, you know recruiting and making business cases for how this is actually good business behavior, profitable behavior to move towards regeneration. And now I just want to focus very quickly on two aspects, mining and agricultural private sector actors. With the map that I've showed, we've seen that mining actors in Europe and elsewhere, and in Finland, you have a lot of experience with that. Mining actors are going to become absolutely instrumental in the transition. They already are, but their role and therefore their political agency, their economic agency, their exposure mm. is going to increase over the next um, two decades. Um, they need to have a sense of what is at stake. And once again, I believe that in Finland, there are lots of, lots of actors that have experience with what are the environmental, social and political consequences of extracting critical materials locally how can we mitigate them how can we um, ensure that there are some proper legal frameworks in place mm -hmm. to use the critical uh, the climate related transitions as a way to equalize and transform power relationships between the global north and the global south and the mining uh, you know uh, companies are going to have an instrumental role to play in this and they're going to have an instrumental role in research to play 
for how to, over time, switch from extraction from underground to extraction from recycling and therefore developing new business chains that are really important for the resilience of the European Union and the future of economies. And on agriculture, your map shows this very well. One of the reasons why European Union member states can say collectively we only emit 7% of global greenhouse gas emissions is because we've outsourced environmental destruction outside of our borders. One of the key supply chains is agriculture. If we look at the footprint, that begs the question, how do we actually transform food production at home? Once again, recovering seed sovereignty, making sure that we switch towards regenerative agriculture, we build water tables at home, ensure bioregional food security systems, we have a role to play in leading that forward because our demand is fueling deforestation and land conversion in the global south. That means that we need to invest into our own food systems and we potentially need to start questioning how agriculture needs to be decoupled from globalized exchange and how this profoundly contributes to climate action. This has been one of the low-hanging fruits it's not an easy one, but it is one of the low hanging fruits as part of climate action, which is usually not discussed at COP26, which often falls down the drain at CBD convention uh, negotiations. Where is agriculture in our conversations? Where, how are we changing the way in which we do globalized exchange, food resilience and adaptation? Food production have a lot of roles to play in that. And it actually can also re reboot regenerative um, ecosystems. And I'm for the record, I'm French, and one of our key geopolitical propositions for the longest time has been that civilizations, cultures, and therefore identities and foods come from diverse soils, which we call terroir. This needs to be recaptured all across the world, not just in countries like France and Italy, but across Europe and actually across the world. We will benefit from food diversification and decoupling potentially from uh, globalized agricultural exchange. Yeah. And I think that in addition to that agricultural production, we have to look at the consumption side. And and where WF is strong, especially in Finland, is sustainable diets. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's at the same time we have to also shift the, the globally the diets towards more more kind of sustainable by increasing num uh, veg vegetables that decreasing meat consumption. Mm -hmm. Because it also it's not also a matter how we produce, but what we produce. And by that, we can also have a significant impact, influence on, on, on the biodiversity and also on the climate. Absolutely. And just on this, it's really important to, and especially in the context of Africa and certain parts of the Middle East, if we look at the role of cattle, it is instrumental in how people, you know, feed themselves, yeah. but also, um, relate to ancestral identities, to yes. land, to livelihoods and things like this. So one of the key things, and this is one in interesting intersection, right? Mm -hmm. We can talk about how to re-gear or redesign our diets in Europe mm -hmm. away from meat consumption, mm -hmm. and we've already started doing that quite a lot. Yep. We should not go in the extreme di you know, direction of saying cattle is really bad for climate, because actually it's not. If we look at methodologies such as what Alan Savory, who has you know, tested methodologies in Zimbabwe for the longest time, he's one of the forefathers of what we call holistic management. Yeah. Holistic management is a very complex methodology, but at the heart of it, there is this notion that actually you can marry sedentary agricultural systems, yeah. crop systems, with cattle management in a rotating fashion that helps to actually regain this ecological mm. interdependency and symbiotic mm. relationship yeah. between soils, cattle, yeah. diets, human, you know, civilizations yeah. and identities, and how therefore we can move forward. The key question is essentially a question of equilibrium. Yeah. You can't, you know, deforest the Amazon for mm. cattle ranching, where your cattle is going to be stuck on mm. the, like in the same place for, you know, 10 years or stuff like this. You're yeah. going to exhaust your soils, your water, your resources, you know, doing that. Mm. Doesn't mean that cattle is not allowed. It means that it needs to be managed according to the health of the land on which it stands and from which it feeds and in relationship to demand, as you're saying, to the rest of the world and mm -hmm. to local populations that it's feeding as well. So it's just about, you know, reshifting the way in which we 
look at ecological interdependencies and ecological health. And that needs to start from the places where we are active. Exactly. exactly. And I think that this brings us back to the sort of complexities and also the fact that there are no uh, sort of one size fits all Absolutely. solutions. Yeah. But maybe also that's a, a good thing in a way that there are many solutions and, and yeah. uh, many opportunities there. Uh, this has been really interesting to follow and I'm uh, as there are no questions uh, in the chat, uh, I was thinking that I have to sort of take this back a little bit to a bit of a more boring and bureaucratic and maybe a, a bit of a very simple question, uh, especially to Olivia, but I guess Anne might also have some insight as to because we, we've been talking about uh, ecological diplomacy as this sort of um, uh, EU level thing that the EU mm -hmm. needs to to act upon. But then what is the role of individual EU member states? What should an, an EU member state do <laughs> to promote ecological diplomacy? First of all, agree or adhere or understand the relevance of the analysis that we're um, offering, like the new, the new mm -hmm. lens essentially, because it is a it's not a new narrative, but it's a complemented narrative that tries to feed in all these different elements together. Security, um, ecological health, biodiversity, mm -hmm. water, soils, um, and climate stabilization or climate action. Second, as a result, look at what each and every individual member states commits in terms of resources at home. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about resources in terms of staff, in terms of research, in terms of funding, in terms of cooperation with, you know, like uh, whole of society actors. Yeah. Um, and see, evaluate or assess um, the current levels of investment with the objectives that we need to set for ourselves. Again, taking into account, and I want to make this very clear, the latest developments on the European continent change everything and tell us about the imperative to adopt ecological diplomacy as the fundamental value proposition that the European Union will hold for its member states and that they will propose to partners across the world so as to make sure that through a race to the top we can de-escalate geopolitical tensions and we can work on planetary health. These are the fundamental objectives that we need to pursue. If we review current national objectives, investments, mm -hmm. strategies in mirror with these objectives, mm -hmm. then we can start saying, OK, so what are the changes that we need to make in our institutions? Are we indeed working on silos? Mm -hmm. Are we pulling enough resources on cross sectorial uh, strategies? Are we uh, investing at home and in the European Union to the level that is needed and with the right staff, methodologies, funding streams and political support? And are we negotiating on climate diplomacy, on foreign affairs conclusions, um, council conclusions, on um, anything also related to you know, negotiations around um, CAP, the Common Agricultural Policy, with the right standards? with the right objectives and are we therefore also and this will uh, i suppose please the current tenant of the external action service are we embracing geopolitical agency at the european level with the right message with the right tools and with the right geostrategic vision do we have the right tools in place from an analytical perspective from a programming perspective from a political dialogue perspective and from a development planning and industrial planning perspective. That's where we're talking about not just a whole of society approach, but a whole of EU approach. So it's looking in with European strategies, looking in with national strategies and um, assessing our effectiveness. We need to do it very, very, very much now um, with the right objectives in mind. And are we pulling resources in the right places? So that Finland could be leading example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, for us. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Mm. Uh, 
Okay, then we will soon run out of time, unfortunately, but um, I would still ask maybe um, with the the attack on, on Ukraine, uh, I think it's quite uh, obvious that the attention of, of all, uh, at least all of Europe has, has really shifted there and, and into this very sort of traditional security thinking and, and geopolitical thinking and so on. Uh, and while I, at least personally, I don't think that uh, there's any sort of risk in a way that, that these ecological diplomacy and security aspects would be forgotten because they will come back. Uh, but how do you think that, or what do you think that ecological security and sort of our, um, our idea, I guess, of security and, and the threats that we are facing in the future, how will they uh, shift and what do you think that they will look like after maybe one year and or what what should they look like ideally and what should the discourse I guess about uh, ecological security be? So what it should look like? No, what it will look like in a year depends on what we notice today, what we observe today and what we learn from today. I am currently working on an article and the pitch line is um, 20th century history meets climate disrupted futures. Mm -hmm. Behind the current revisionist attack that President Putin is organizing on Ukraine at the moment lies a very geostrategic outlook on what is happening mm -hmm. in the world. President Putin has never given any thought to climate action. That much we know. What President Putin has understood, however, is the risks and opportunities of climate related transitions. If you look at the behavior of Russia and China across the world, you will notice that the places where they are present today are all the places that are endowed in critical materials needed for the transition, in the places that are well endowed in terms of soil productivity and in water resources. So what you see in Ukraine is actually a case of what I'm going to call climate hoarding. What President Putin is doing behind revisionist strategies, which serve his imperialistic purposes, is indeed trying to become a power broker in supply chains that, that, you know, um, that have to do with critical materials that the European Union has been trying to diversify for the last few years and which is having greatest difficulty diversifying. President Putin has mentioned that he wants Russia to benefit from climate change to become an agricultural powerhouse. Acquiring Ukraine within the Russian economy will go a long way in that direction because Ukraine is the European breadbasket. So what President Putin is trying to do is trying to be a first mover into recreating essentially the natural resource base that Russia needs to rely upon in order to create new types of dependencies from an agricultural, from the water, and from an energy perspective. If we don't see that today, if at the European Union level we fail to understand the geopolitical and geostrategic outlook that actors such as Russia and China have already adopted as an integral DNA of their own transition, the European Union runs the risk of breaking within the next 10 to 15 years. And I'm not saying this lightly. So in order to preempt that and to change this, then we need to understand again that the value proposition of ecological diplomacy is fundamentally about saying climate transitions and geopolitics are one and the same today. And if we want to do climate transitions in a way that safeguards planetary health, climate stabilizations, avoids and preempts cascading risks coming from climate disruptions and therefore centers on human security and human rights based approaches, we have a geopolitical message that is going to rival and be of value to partners that are asking, demanding, in fact, European support for resilience in climate disrupted futures. This 
is what we need to embrace today. Put on that. Yeah, uh, I think, uh, and, and we believe that the, the, the climate and, and biodiversity loss will be and still relevant points for discussion because it's more and more people are aware of, they are aware of it. They can see and observe their own eyes. But the question is the decision makers, are they brave enough to actually realize that now it's time to act and that, that we cannot anymore postpone those decisions of this kind of quite big transformation, what is needed in our systems to be more climate resilient and also stop the biodiversity loss. Mm -hmm. But they, there is a public demand and everybody, even the decision makers can observe it, but it's about the courage now to make a decision. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm afraid we're going to have to end there. There was one more question about uh, uh, resilience and, and what it means in terms of whether that's uh, whether we're aiming for an equilibrium. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm afraid that that's such a big question that we can't, <laughs> can't have time for it now. Uh, I can direct the person who's asking the question to the latest uh, IPCC report and the summary for policymakers because they they do delve into the what resilience means mm -hmm. in the climate disrupted future quite at length. Good point. Great. <laughs> so we even got an answer. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you so much for, for your presentation thank and you. for the discussion. I think it was really interesting, at least for me. <laughs> I hope it was also interesting for our, our uh, audience. And thank you for being, being there. And uh, yeah, thank you to everyone. <laughs> thank you for your patience and your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Olivia.